we have uh, an ellipse. And you've seen stuff like this before. This is a, a problem that, uh, that's actually loved in pre-calc and calculus, where actually in the past you've had like trying to fit something into a parabola. Right, so you've sort of done constraint problems before, right? But so this one's talking about having an ellipse and trying to fit the largest uh, rectangle you can, I'm assuming, by what? By, in this case, by perimeter. You can do the same thing with like, by area. So what function do I want to maximize? The perimeter of the rectangle. The perimeter of the rectangle. Uh, according to the constraints that they give, right? Okay. Uh, so your constraint function is the ellipse. What do you get? 4y. We have 4x squared plus 9y squared, 36. And the function you're trying to maximize is the uh, perimeter of this rectangle. Okay. Which should be 2 times x plus y, right? Yeah, so in this case, we can set up our coordinate system there, maybe. Mm -hmm. Right? So here's. So in this case, uh, whatever x is. And yeah, what's the. So the whole length here would be 2x. And what would the whole width be? 2y. 2y. Wherever you are, and so what, what am I really picking here? I'm picking a, I'm actually picking a point on the ellipse and then drawing the a corresponding rectangle, right? So wherever point I pick, that xy of that point sets up the width and the length of the rectangle. Is that, so I'm trying to catch up on how you try to set this up. That's a key point there. How are we doing so far with this? Can you guys, if you read through that problem, the very first step you want to do is, what am I actually trying to maximize or minimize? Try to get that equation down. And what's it got to, the points I can use have to be where, and in this case, it's got to be on that ellipse, right? So to me, that's the, uh, that's the easiest way to approach that. Okay, cool. So then what's my perimeter formula going to be? Four. I love it, cool. And then you want to maximize this given that constraint. Okay. All right. And do we want to, maybe this is a good time to go through the steps. So what's the first step on this problem? What, what would we call this? I don't know if you guys remember. Fx. Which is uh, f of x. This is my constraint. Mm -hmm. So which letter do we give to the constraint? G. G, that's right. So G of x, y. And actually, that's going to be, you can say 4x squared plus 9y squared minus 36 equals 0, right? So when I eventually let that equal 0, that's going to be one of my system of equations. Equations. Uh, and then this guy is going to be f of xy, right? Cool. Right, so this is not a bad uh, example to go ahead and do. So maybe this will be one gimme on your homework. but. Let me at least get the steps from you and then have you guys try to do the steps if you haven't done this problem yet. Um, what are the steps? What's the first step? What, what's the overriding relationship that I want to use here? It's the gradient of f equals lambda times the gradient of g. So the gradient of f equals lambda gradient of g. Yeah, so just take part of the yeah, so then you have your fx equals lambda gx, fy equals lambda gy, and then you finally have g of xy equals zero. Because one piece of this was assuming that this uh, g was really just a level curve of some bigger function, but we're going to set it equal to zero later anyway. So we aren't using any of the other, we're just using what's on that xy plane, right? Okay, so go ahead and try this out. This, I mean, I love formulas like this. This kicks ass. I love this kind of formula, especially if you remember just the pieces of this. I'm not dealing with truly three variables here for my gradients that I really just have to do fx, fy, because that's the only things I've got. It's not a level surface. It's a level curve that I'm working with.
solving for lambda here, or kind of less? Well, when you get to the equations, you try to see what you can pull out. What's going to be the most useful equation, and I start there. So what do you get for the first equation? What's fx? Four. Four equals lambda times, and what's gx? Eight x. Eight x. And the second one says uh, fy, so that's four again. Four. Lambda times, and what's g y? 18 y. And then the last one says, set this equal to zero. So from the first equation, we got lambda equal one over two x. Two x. Just put x yep. in the And lambda equals one over two x, yeah. Cool. Uh, two over nine Here we get lambda equals one over or two over nine y. Yeah. We can't do. Can you get anything about x and y here? I mean, you can get x in terms of lambda, of course, but that's not very telling, really. Um, there are a couple different ways you can go from here. If lambda equals that, and lambda equals that. The most direct thing you can do is set them equal to each other, right? Or you could solve for x and solve for y and then plug it in here. You know, solve for x, plug it in for that. Right? There's a couple of ways you can go. Uh, try it out. See what you get. I mean, this is where you just have to start. Sometimes you'll get functions that don't seem to tell you much, but you find the ones that tell you the most. These actually tell me pretty much. Right? They tell me a decent amount. So you can get a relationship between these two, between x and y, and then you can plug that in here and, and see what's got to happen. Try to solve for each variable, right? Try to finish that out. This guy is freaking out here. Let's see. Come on. Solving for x, so I have 1 over 2x equals 1 over 5, 2 over 9y. You can do it, Jeff. Okay. So then you get, like, if you solve for x, you'll get um, 2x, let's see, you get 9y over 4. Yes, cool. Okay. And then you plug that in here. So now if you plug in 9y over 4 uh, here, you'll get uh, 4 times 36y, 36 together, uh, 81y squared over uh, 16. You can solve that for y. You guys kind of get the idea here? The nice thing is, I mean, you've got to have a little faith in what you get from these. One of them, or two of them, or all of them are going to be easy to work with. Very infrequently, you get all three are very strange and you can't do a damn thing with them. At the very least, you can solve for x or solve for y and plug it into this guy. Because that's what you're supposed to do to solve equations. You can substitute. So there's a lot of different ways you can approach these based on how they come out looking. Uh, this one's a little weird. I don't think we've seen one exactly like this yet. But, I mean, these lead me to this. This, I'll get uh, 81y squared over 4 plus 9. It'd be 81 plus 36. What is that? 117. Uh, y squared over 4. Does that look right? You guys with me now? 4, 4 times 9. This will be 4 there. Uh, 
81 plus 36, right? 117, y squared of 4 equals 36. So throw the 36 over, multiply by 4, divide by 117, take the square root. Woo! Right? Now notice that I really want you to see, if I pick one point, that kind of already presupposes these other four points. They're, I, mean, I just have to pick one point for one corner of this rectangle, and the whole thing is determined, right? It's got to be a rectangle. I'm assuming it's going to be um, not rotated somehow weird. It's, it's going to have to be kind of going along with the ellipse. So when I pick a point, it's got to go over and down and over. I mean, I, one point determines everything. So if I get an answer for this and an answer for that, it's like not really two different answers, truly. Okay, maybe. So I don't know, let's see what we get here. We get y squared equals y equals plus or minus square root of 36 times 4 is 144 divided by 117, whatever the hell that is. If I'm doing all my adding and stuff, right? And then to get x, you just plug it in for x. I mean, plug it in for y and solve for x. Is that cool? How do you feel about that? Now, twelve nine. I got to tell you, twelve nine is uh, really not easy to tell why it necessarily works. I tried my darndest to, to show you why certain things had to be orthogonal and two things had to be orthogonal to the same thing. So they must be related by some multiple. They have to be multiple. They have a parallel means for vectors. So that's where this comes from, and then this leads to rather easy math. Partials, we love partials. Damn it. Give me some freaking partials, please. Derivatives are easy, and then when you let me hold all these other variables constant, hell yes, please, dear God, let me do it. So that those are relatively easy. The equations they come out with sometimes are kind of freaky, but you can use all three of them or how many of them you get inside each other, right? So it's not very often, but sometimes you might get into, like, you start plugging it in and start getting circular logic, but you just have to be careful about where you plug stuff in. All right. So I don't know what you guys end up with there, but nothing too pretty, it looks like. Right? I mean, this is plus or minus 12 over square root of 117. We can at least do that much. And then multiply by 9 fourths, it becomes 27 over, right? So then x will be plus or minus 27 over square root of 117. She's simplifying. Oh, cool. Okay. But you guys get the idea. How many points do I have up there total? Four. And are they really truly separate points? Like we talked about earlier, I expected to get kind of four points in a way because I, I could pick that point there or there or there and there and they all describe the same rectangle. I like to see something come out in the math that matches with what the hell I thought would happen from the picture. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, cool. I'm an optimistic fool, so I think that to be good. Okay. So today we're getting into. Um, Multivariable calculus is weird because you start off with vectors, and how long has it been since we've talked truly directly about vectors? It's been a while, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. And but notice now it is kind of having a very direct route. We did in chapter twelve we did differentiation of functions with multivariables, right? So, of course, in chapter 13, we're going to have to do the reverse. We're going to have to talk about how to integrate things with more than one variable in them. Yay. <laughs> All right, so we got this here? I'll leave that up there for a moment. function let's 
Let's say like that. How many ways can I truly can I take a first derivative of that function? Two ways. So if I break it down into its derivatives, going backwards, I should expect that it's not going to be one integral that can get me back because it was two derivatives for me to go forward, right? So I want to undo differentiation for integration. We all know that they're opposites of each other. So if I can differentiate this sucker twice, because based on the direction I want to go, I should have to kind of expect that I'm going to integrate twice somehow. So um, with the aid of computer technology, thank God, I can show you guys some pictures so we can talk about what the hell's going to happen. Don't worry. And let me actually, before I throw that up there, let me um, say this. One of the easiest little uh, dudes, don't, don't go screaming away, uh, is if we have something like a little Pac-Man ghost, right? So we have this little Pac-Man ghost. I see it. You need the little, the little bottom part. What's that? You need the little squiggly bottom. Yeah, the squiggly bottoms. <laughs> 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 Uh, and this is um, in the xy plane. This could be, those are like maybe the um, inputs I use to create this thing, right? Well, that side doesn't look like it belongs, but all together. Let's go with it. So I use that rectangular region to actually get those outputs, right? And this is what we've been talking about for a while the fact that my inputs are now points in the xy plane, my outputs are now heights above that on the z axis, right? So when I want to integrate this thing, I can use ideas that we've used before. We can use ideas from Calc plus 1 to help us. So in Calc 1, we had something much easier for Jeff to draw. And we broke this bad boy up into rectangles, and then we went to town on those. Right? And we added those areas, and then we let the rectangles get really small. In two dimensions, rectangles are not going to be enough, of course, because this thing has area. So what do I have to use now to kind of build up to this top? I can't just use rectangles to go from here up. You can actually consider step out by one z. Step out by a, a unit of z. What am I going to now create if I step out? This rectangle is now going to become some kind of a big box, right? So let me show you a much better picture of what's going on here. If I can, let's see, here it is. You were like this, you were like, my boat. My boat. So now if I try to do this in 3D, I get these little boxes now if I extend it out. Thank you. I thought so. So if you take... Uh, one approach. There's two different approaches we can take to kind of talk about this. I'm going to try to take both of them. <laughs> one approach is very similar to what we did back in Calc 1. Remember in Calc 1 we had something like this here? Yeah. Oh, this beautiful thing. Uh, and you let this thing go to n, and you let n go to infinity, right? And this told you this symbol, of course, becomes good, integral symbol, right? Elongated s for sum. And then this is just f of x. And then this, of course, became dx. Well, now what I'm going to have is I'm going to have these little boxes. Neato. Oh, my God. Oh, sweet. You remind me of um, no, the little toys, you know, where you put like your Yeah, face you put out. your face in there yeah. and it comes out. Exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It looks like a really <laughs> dense city of Minecraft. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Too much. But in this case, you can see how in yeah. order to add these boxes up, we want to do something very similar to this. I'm going to have to go in both directions, right? I've got to sum all the boxes up for some given x. I've got to sum, add all these boxes up. So I'm going to go from this to this on the y. 
And then, of course, I want to add these up, and then I want to add these up. So one way to think about it is I've got to add all the boxes up, starting here and going here, and then going here. I've got to go in both directions somehow, mm -hmm. right? So if I call this box um, x1, y1, then this will be box x1, y2. And why do I say that? Because what's kind of held constant along this line? Yes. X is held constant. So these will all be x1s. So like I, X, I, Y, J. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that notation before. X, I, Y, J. So as I step through this, I have to add up. So now I have, um, now, i got to sum a double sum. So I've got to add up like, uh, let me make this a little more clear. F of X, I, Y, J. Okay. And you notice up here, what was this back in Calc 1? What was that piece right there? Well, it's, yeah, but more general, sorry. More general than that. It's the, the width of every single rectangle, right? You can do other methods where you have a width change, but you normally don't do that. Because we quickly go past it and just get straight to the interval anyway. Who cares about how wide the stupid things are? Let them go to zero anyway. So this was the width of the rectangles. Now this then is going to have to be the, the area, the common area of the bottom of all these boxes. And of course, to get the volume of the box, we have to multiply by the height, which is designated by the output, just like it was here. This was the height times the width, that's the area of the rectangle. Here's the height times the area of the base, that's going to be the volume of the box. And of course we should expect this to somehow lead to a double integral. Do the same limit thing we did here. Let the little boxes I'm using get infinitesimally small areas. Cool. And then we get this here. And we put a little r there. Now, the little r there, what actually made this picture up here? Why did they draw it exactly the way they drew it? Does this graph stop here? Why did they draw this the way they did? Because somebody chose what? Why did they draw this piece of the graph? Somebody chose the inputs that they wanted to use, right? Just like you get to choose in, in Calc 1, you choose x from 1 to 3 or x from 7 to 8. I can choose the region that I'm integrating over in the xy plane. So that's what that R there stands for. It just stands for what region do we want to use. In the early going, we use pure rectangles. And then we go to triangles and different things and neat shapes, right? And when the shapes get really ugly, that's when this gets a little bit harder. Eventually, we're going to use uh, polar coordinates because we know a lot of shapes are easier to define using polar coordinates. Oh yeah, and eventually we're going to go to spherical and cylindrical coordinates. All right. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now, the other way to approach this is if I had a, a, a question you got a lot in Calc 1, was find the area, you know, this is when you're very beginning, when you're first learning area, find the area under this given curve. So they give you some curve and they say, what's the area under that curve? From point to something. Yeah, you know, let's say very general from point A to point B. Okay. I like it. Right. So now we're going to be given, uh, for example, a, a very easy problem to start with is find the area under some plane to the x, y. So now the area under curve here is understood to go down to the x axis. Now I say find the area under some surface, I know I'm going to go down to the xy plane. Right, the area between the xy plane, I mean the volume now, so the, the, between the xy plane and the surface itself. How we do? So there's a lot of analogies here, thank God, since most of you guys understand your Calc 1 pretty well. Calc 3 is really built on the same principle. And the really cool thing is this. I, I want you to understand, um, here's my x, here's my y. Um, here, I would do integral from A to B, uh, f of x, 
dx. No problem. It's got to be one interval and I'm done. Here, I would want to, for example, um, if I could slice this for some given x, if I could slice it, I could get the integral of just that shape, just the cross section. I wish they had one like this. They have one with the plane, but it's kind of boring. If I could cut this somewhere so I could just get a shape, and what would that shape look like? It would look like that, maybe. Just cut it this way. You guys semi with me. And then I have a, one, uh, a two dimensional problem. I can find that area. But well, what's the problem? How make the whole volume then? Then I gotta add them up all along this way. If I let x equal something specific, I can get that little cross-sectional area. Then how do I get the whole volume? Well, add up all the freaking areas from here to there. Then I get the whole volume, right? Okay, so I need these. And really, that's what we do with uh, who knows the formula for the volume of a cylinder. <clears throat> It's too high. <laughs> What's the area of the base? What's the area of the base? Very square. And how tall is it? Yeah. So isn't that really what we're doing here? The area of the base times the height. It's repeated, so we just we do that. So this is kind of similar to what we do here. Just that the height now is going to be different everywhere we look. Okay. So let me go straight to this picture. I think this is the best way to kind of talk about this. Let me see if we want any of this. Oh, this is just showing the limiting process, right? There's your little area in the xy plane. You go multiply by the height to get the volume of the box, and then you add them all up and you let the boxes go to infinity to get the true volume. Same thing we did before. Here's the thing I was talking about earlier too about Get that out here. Slicing it at some given x, getting the area by doing one interval, and they have to integrate across all possible values of x. So there's where your two intervals come from. One integral is just get the area of the cross section, the other integral is to add up all those cross sectional areas. So um, for this picture right there, what would the, inter what would the uh, area of this be? So we're given some function z equals f of x, y. Let me make sure we're all, how tall is this thing? That, at any point, right? So for some given x value, that red one, what would the area of that red shape be? Yeah, integral from c to d. F of, and let's call this for some x uh, 1. So for some given x in between a and b, I'm going to call it x 1 just so we know it's a given some, some constant x. We're going to let x be constant. I can get the area of the cross section. So this is just the area of that cross section. How do I then get the area of the, 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 the volume of the whole thing then. I have to do what with each of these? Careful. I want to see if we can take this step. If you take this step, it would be awesome. What would it be for some other x2? This would, of course, be if I pick some other, if I pick some other x here. What would the area of that one be? Integral c to d, f of x2 comma y, right? So x1 plus x wait. So what do I need to do? If I could get every single one of these, I can add them all up. How many of these are there? An infinite freaking number. Let me I'll get this back up. How do I add an infinite number of things then? We use an <laughs> integral. Yes, so in calculus, if I have an infinite number of things to add, I can use an integral possibly in there. Right? This is exactly the situation where I want to use an integral. Because doesn't this, for any x, what's the cross-sectional area? Integral from c to d, f of x, y, d, y, where these are both. So isn't the cross-sectional area itself a function of x? Right? 
as I change x, is in the cross section which area possibly changing, depending on if this is getting taller or shorter? Okay, maybe, sort of, not real. Okay. So these then, this itself is a function. It changes value. If I look at this, straight on from x. Right, so now I'm looking at it there. Right, I'm looking at it straight on. At every point, here's x1. Here's x2. Here is, oh, what was it again? A to B. Right, so at x1, it's got some value. At x2, it's got some value. At B, it's got some value. At A, it's got some value. And it looks something, I don't know what it's going to look like, but let's just pretend like that. How do I get the total, how do I sum that up then? Take the integral of that. This integral, we should be used to this. Integrals are themselves functions when there's still a variable left around at the end. Right? Why would there be a variable left around at the end? Because it's the integral with respect to y. x stays x. This is sort of the integral of the partial with respect to y. You, you let x stay the same. You let x remain constant. Isn't there going to still be an x variable when, the, when you do this integral? Yes. So then x can vary. x goes from a to b. And what's the function that you're integrating that you want to put in there? This one. I want to integrate all of the cross-sectional areas from a to b. So this function represents all of your cross-sectional areas. And how you put them back together to make the whole volume then? You add all of these up across all the values that x can have. Now, now one thing I want you to realize is I could have done everything I just did the other freaking way. Right? I could have let y be constant and did it the other way. So what's kind of cool is these are interchangeable for rectangular regions. Notice something very, you got to be really careful about. It. The order here matters. This dx goes with which one of these, the first or the second? That dx goes with the second one, right? You better make sure that if you have dx on the inside, you have what, what the hell x is doing on this inside integral, right? Very easy to flip those limits and you get weird ass answers. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. Okay. All right, here we go. I want to do an example from the book, and actually it's got a picture associated with it, thank God. Is that the one I want to use? Choose that one. Actually, there we go. So this image here, I can play with it here. Get up there. All right. There it is. So what's going on here is, like I said earlier, they have a plane, and they want to know the volume under that plane. So what we're going to do is we're going to slice it like we said. We're going to let y be constant, for example. So this has got an actual uh, concrete functional value associated with it there. They gave me the actual function. So z equals, uh, let's see, 6 minus 2x minus y. Let me see which way do you want. Yeah. So change in the area is dx dy. Yes, cool. Exactly. And, they, and that's actually sort of a big deal is to um, show that the interval that we did earlier, the interval over region R dA, is the same thing as this thing. This thing is called an iterated interval. I'm not the biggest believer in the importance of names of things all the time. And this is another case of that. But where did you see that word iterated before? Iterations. Has anybody ever seen that word before? No. You've been in count two, so it's weird that you have a series. Yeah, in series. Yeah. Iterations means you do something over and over and over again. Right? So when you have <laughs> ten iterations, I mean you do something ten times. 
right? I took my clothes to the wash through 10 iterations and it was still dirty shit. Oh my god, fix that washing machine. <laughs> um, so this one, I, I, they gave me this plane and they're asking me what the volume of the uh, underneath it is, what that volume is all the way up. Another way to look at this is if this was uh, some funky ass shed in the backyard and it's got a roof defined by this. I guess they get a lot of snow, it's very, very steep. I want to know what's the volume of that shit, right? How much stuff could I pack into that shit? So that would be really what that is. So you see a lot of examples of problems uh, where the, this is actually the physical shape of the thing. Uh, we'll see some examples of uh, mass density, how to get the total mass of something by knowing the, uh, the density of it along as it changes. If it's really dense in the middle versus on the outside, it's not very dense. Then it wouldn't be the physical shape, it would just be the density function on the top. So, uh, for this guy, a couple examples. We're letting y be something <coughs> constant on this picture. Do you guys see that? I want to let y be something constant. So if I turn this thing around, I should get a really nice, well, let me turn it the other way. Here we go. Hopefully it's not making you sick. There you go. Let it go, Jeff. That's good. You can almost see that. So if I turn this thing around, I get this nice shape here. So in two dimensions, that's a pretty easy problem. So let's say, uh, let's say <coughs> we take y equal to, and I can't remember now, I think my, my constraints. This is in the book on page 879. Here we go, my constraints are, oh, let me see, where'd it go? Uh, X goes from zero to one, Y goes from zero to two. Right, so that's the rectangular region in the XY plane down there. That's the points that are actually creating this output plane on top of it. So let's say we take Y equal to one to kind of see what this thing would look like. What would the function be then? Yeah, it'd be 6 minus 2x minus 1, so it'd be 5 minus 2x. So the yz plane, this thing would look like... Not yz plane, xz plane. At 0, it'd be 5. At, yeah, exactly. At uh, and, y, and x can go up to 1, so at 1, this thing would be... Three, right? You do it, Jeff. There you go. So there's my function then. That's basically what you see up there. Is that cool? Their slope is a little more pronounced than mine, but oh, too bad for me. It's because it made this a big ass scale here. Um, how are we doing so far? This is the cross section. So I just cut this thing right at the y equals one line, and this is the shape that I get. So how would I find that area? Integral 5 minus 2x. Yeah, from 0 to 1. Dx, right? That's awesome. This is calc 1. Eat it up for lunch, right? Not too bad. Let's not do that interval, actually. We, we all could do that interval, but let's not. It's not by itself, it's not going to tell me much. The problem, of course, is I could do that, but to get the whole volume, I have to let y be y, right? I want to add up, I can make y equal to 0, y equal to 2, y equal to 0. 0.7, y equal to 1.924. That's not going to get me anywhere. I want to let y be y because there's too many things it could be. I don't want to go that route, right? So what I want to do then is, what's the general cross-sectional area for some given y value? Yeah, it's going to be... Uh, integral from what to what? And what's not going to change? I don't care what I make y, what's not going to change? If I make y 2, then this would be 6 minus 2 is 4, but it's still going to be from 0 to 1, because that's what x does, right? x goes from 0 to 1. 
So whatever I make y, the limits are still going to be 0 to 1. So now if I made y equal to 1 like we just did, I would get this. If I made y equal to 2, I get 4 minus 2x. I have to integrate that. Right? So that would be related to shifting the y around. So I can make y equal to uh, 0, or I can make y equal to 2. And that's moving around in there, right? Of course, if y equal to 2, it's not as tall. Because I'm subtracting y. Of course, I mean, the bigger I make y, it's not as tall. So this is the general cross-sectional area. How do I get the volume from this then? These are all my cross-sectional areas. What's y do? Switch from 0 to 5. Yeah, no, careful. Y goes from 0 to 2. Careful. This is z. And I'm not, my limits are not going to be z because z is actually a function that I'm integrating over, right? Or, or the function that I'm trying to find an interval for. So what's going to show up when the limits are going to be what my inputs do. And my y input goes from 0 to 2. So when I add up, all of my individual cross sections for each y. And that's, of course, what we just did up here. Now, let me go ahead and let you try that. Let's, let's, if, I'm, if I was out there, I'm like, just let me do the damn problem, Jeff. Let me see what the hell happens. So try it, realizing that what's going on in here? What am I holding constant in there? Y. And of course, what tells you that? It's sort of like fx, the little x, tells you y is being held constant. Integral dx tells you y is being held constant. Same idea. So I'm rooting for you. See how far you can get with this thing. So you guys have already done it because it took you so long to get there. That's all right. show up in the answer to this is y, because you're putting in values for x. And that's why it makes sense that the outer integration is going to be with respect to y so that you can get rid of that variable. I want a true answer here. I want to know what the area really is. It's not going to be some function of something. I should get the area, because all everything's set. So what are you guys getting on the inside? Well, how's that integrate? 6x. X squared. Beautiful, right? You gotta be real careful. It's being held constant, so the interval of the constant picks up that variable, right? So minus xy. Evaluated from 0 to 1. I love my from 0 integrals because in this case they all have an x in it. So the only thing I gotta worry about is what it is at 1, right? And right now the uh, x is the constant or this inner integral, everything is about x being the variable. So what am I plugging 1 and 0 in for? x. Because I haven't done the integral with respect to y yet, right? Because these limits are for y. These limits are for x. Cool. So plugging a 0 in for x, this all goes to 0. Plugging a 1 in for x, what do you get? 5 minus 5 minus y. Yeah, so you get uh, 6 minus 1 is 5 minus 1y. So 5 minus y. Yeah, so you integrate that respect to y, you get 5y minus y squared over 2. You get 8. Cool. <laughs> Now, if I'm you right now, I'm like, I love this section. Please do God. This section is really major ass. And it does kick major ass. 
it goes along with the same ideas we got for Calc 1, how to build an interval, right? But now it's volumes instead of areas, so I've got to go in both directions somehow, and that's taken care of. What's another way I could have done this interval? Yeah, I could just switch the limits here. The only time you could just switch the limits and not have to worry about it is when you have a rectangular region. And let's look real quick. What's this thing look like in the XY plane? Yeah, it's, it's going from uh, 0 to 1 for the X, and then from 0 to 2 for the Y. So here it is. So let me ask you something that sounds like a really weird question to ask right now. What's as X does what, Y does what? As X goes from 0 to 1, Y goes from 0 to 2. So it really doesn't matter which order I do it in. Big deal. If I go up and over to get to my house, I can go over and up to get to my house. As long as there's no canyon in the middle. But you get the idea, right? If I'm flying a plane or whatever. But we know the same thing as slope. I don't care which one I do first. As long as it's a rectangular region that I'm going over. So let me give you guys a couple of try from this section. We'll take a break, and then we'll do the next section. Because the next section is where your graphs are going to be uber important, right? Your ability to graph in two dimensions, hopefully, is good. <laughs> you might need some isometric, but not too soon. You should actually be able to do all 